What do you see as the most crucial chapter for your book, Hope for Fun? Ah. Uh. <laughs> and why? <laughs> as opposed to like identifying like a core chapter in the book, I think there's several takeaways that uh, I find that come through in each chapter. The, the first and kind of most resonant thing that I found when I read the book, you know, proofing it for myself, was what I say is there's no template for what is the proper way to direct, what is the proper way to produce, what is the proper way to collaborate. You have to approach each thing as a custom fit. How are we going to make it work? A lot of the things that we're taught in film schools and so on, or we observe on film sets that we think often is given, if you subscribe to that notion, it's gonna restrict your opportunities. The, the most case in point I see on that is decisiveness, right? We're told that we want directors to always lead to be the person that can make up their mind on the spot and say we're doing this. And some of the best directors who've made the most beautiful movies I've been lucky to collaborate on aren't particularly decisive. They're, they're weighing the decision. They're human beings, right? They're having to figure that out. And I think they might have been overlooked if that's what somebody was looking for in a director, right? Each time, I think you really need, as a producer, to learn how that director wants to work, right? And build your structure to allow that. Sometimes they're not going to be great on set at deciding what to do when something changes. That's just who they are. And it doesn't mean they're not going to give you something truly unique that has that stamp of individuality on it. The second thing that really resonates for, for me in looking over the book is how much chaos, how much other stuff happens on movies. You know, I, I like to speak, I mentioned it today, of producing as, to some degree, managing complexity, right? That, that things go wrong, you have to accept it. That's why this production, to deal with the, the problems. But looking through my movies, each one, almost, had this moment where the movie collapsed or somebody went crazy or something went terribly wrong. And if I shared that with my director or if I shared that with my financier or my distributor, more could have happened. But I, as the producer and, or the producing team, you know, had to shoulder that, had to find a way to solve it, get it done. In a lot of ways in my, my experience, that is almost a signature event of the movie, but sometimes my collaborators didn't know anything about it because I had to shield them from yet another problem that wasn't going to be about telling a great story. The final thing that in, in an overall that has resonated for me today with the book is that it's very easy to think we're responsible for everything that happens to us, right? That it's our hard work or our good ideas or our great taste that has allowed these things to happen. In thinking it through, I started to recognize the privilege that I've had, you know, starting with being a, a white middle class male in America, that those four things gave me entree that many people are denied. It gave me access, it gave me opportunity. I also had a lot of good fortune that a lot of things that, that I was able to, to help build or launch partially came about because of a scene, because of a collective effort, right? Because we all wanted to go to New York at that particular time. You know, some friends have been really generous and say, wow, reading your book, it's like the launching of American independent film. You were there when it all happened. Yes, I was there. And so was about another 150 other people who were doing the same thing. It's like, oh, you discovered Ang Lee. Yeah, I discovered Ang Lee when he walked into my office. 
you discovered, you know, your assistants, Anthony Bregman, great producer, Glenn Basner, great film sales person. Yeah, when they walked into my office, I discovered them. But, you know, and with all the directors that I've uh, worked with, they're wonderful, super talented people, but they were always diamonds, you know? They're easy to spot, right? They give off a glow. What they needed was somebody to, you know, cut the carrots so that they really, you know, were allowed to be as glorious as they, they could be. You know, I think it's really important to see that it's always a team effort. It requires a bit of good fortune of being in the right place at the right time. And that there are always a series of events be behind what is happening at the time, right? You had to get there. I often felt as a young man, you know, I dropped out of college. I was incredibly dedicated and passionate and obsessed with, with making independent movies, which I didn't know what they were yet. They were still, you know, coming into their own. But at the same time, you know, I had a family that would have taken care of me if I ran out of money and I had to come back home. I might have been living, you know, pretty spoon to mouth, but there was a place that I could go to. I wasn't on my own. I had a support structure. You know, people welcomed me when I walked into their office, right? I, I was trained on societal conventions of how to conduct myself. I was able to do those things, and that helped a lot. I was, I was fortunate. So I think those four aspects, I, I guess, are all really kind of key to how can you uh, lead a creative life? I hope the final takeaway that people have in the book is I recognize, I was, I was fortunate uh, early in my career that I made a movie that I loved that I was told was unsellable. It was a total failure, right? People looked at it and said, this film just won't sell to anybody. It's gay. It's Chinese, and it feels like a film from the 1940s, except it's gay and Chinese, right? The film won the Berlin Film Festival. It was Ang Lee's second movie, The Wedding Banquet. And my business partner, James Seamus, and I had to sell it ourselves because it had been rejected everywhere. And we took a $700,000 film, sold it for $3 million across every territory in the world at a low sales fee, which we turned more money back to our investors, which made them do another film right away with Ang Lee. And I was able to, to have the, the clarity of that moment to recognize that the industry, the business, was lagging behind where the art, the artists, the audience, the technology was. We had all moved faster, and the legacy practices couldn't work for what we were doing. We were able to start a sales company based on that experience. We found a, it was at that Berlin Film Festival that I met David Lindy, who became the third partner in Good Machine, right? Built our sales company. Through the work that he did and through that model that, that we committed to, we made 45 films that we financed ourselves without having any capital. We owned half of those movies, right? I think that if you read the book and you think about today, not just the past that it's writing about, but you start to try to say, how can I be perceptive to recognize how that situation is occurring right now, where the art, the artist, the audience, the technology has moved forward ahead of the legacy business and market practices of the industry. You, me, all of us hopefully, we'll start to see that there's similar opportunity where we can build a new model that can allow a ambitious and diverse film culture to not just uh, be sustainable, but to also thrive. That's what I hope is the hope for film that people find in the book.